Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast, where we break down the practical strategies of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. This is your host, executive and life coach, Meredith Oak, and I've got a special invitation for you. We appreciate you so much that we wanted to do something to make this podcast even more valuable for you. So we have created a podcast portal where eight of our most downloaded info rich episodes are available to search by keyword. That means you can put in any keyword that you remember or want to know more about. And within about five seconds, you will have the timestamp of where that word comes up in each episode with a transcript. This is super cool. We also have a couple of free downloads in there, including our product recommendation guide and a link to the practitioner directory. So please go to qbcpod.com and get immediate access to all of that. That's qbcpod.com. See you on the inside. In this episode, we meet another MD who is exploring the quantum biologic paradigm. Dr. Gregory Stenken is board certified in emergency medicine and sports medicine, and has been in practice for over 15 years, working in ER, urgent care, as well as with athletes of all ages and levels. In our conversation, he shares how the limits of the established healthcare model pushed him to look for deeper answers, such as the healing power of nature, the real role of mitochondria, and how those forces work together to protect and heal our brains. As an ER and sports doc, he's seen a lot of head injuries. And as a student of quantum biology, he explains how his approach to treating and preventing them has radically shifted. Enjoy. Hello, Dr. Stenken. Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. It's so nice to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm really excited about this. Okay, so I'm really excited too because you uh, you have a background in emergency medicine, sports medicine, and a certification in applied quantum biology, which I think is like a super fascinating combination. <laughs> uh, you you're probably the well, you are the only person in the world who has that because I know everyone <laughs> who's gone through. <laughs> I know what they do. Um, So tell us a little bit just about your background as a doctor, especially working with in the sports medicine field and and what you, you know, tended to specialize in and and see most often. Yeah. Well, I think um, in the sports medicine side, when I started with going into medicine, it was really my interest was, okay, this is, I'm going to teach people, I'm going to be able to show people how to be healthier and not talk about treating mm-hmm. disease, but preventing disease or not even even having to talk about disease. And uh, so that's where I kind of got into going into getting into the sports medicine vein. I thought, okay, well, that's sort of a, a wellness track within medicine, but just in general, had a lot oh, of interest. Interesting. In- so you were drawn to that because it, it offered a way for you to be a doctor and get in front of people while they were still well and get more on the prevention track than to have them when they're in full-blown crisis. Exactly. At least in theory. That's what I thought. In theory. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's it turns super out it's, interesting. Okay. <laughs> but it turns out it's a lot of, it still ends up being a lot of injury treatment and disease treatment um, right. or, or managing those. So you have athletes with asthma or something like that. And so how do yeah. you reconcile those two and help somebody optim, you know, and, and that's, there's, that's valid too, trying to optimize one's health in the face of some sort of challenge like that. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of how I, I got there. And, but of course, kind of the nature of, of the beast in terms of conventional medicine is it's a lot of pharmacology and it's, it's a lot of disease prevention. And so you just sort of get into that mode. And, you know, more recently, you know, especially in the last few years, I've, I've sort of tried to kind of get myself back on track in terms of thinking about, well, I, you know, I want to try to get back into showing people how to be well and, and take mm-hmm. good care of themselves. And so that's, that's where I've been heading now, um, as far as, as that goes. Okay. And when, so you're circling back around and I, I mean, I would imagine with the doctors that I've spoken to, um, over the last few years, most of them in order to really fulfill that mission feel they have to leave the medical healthcare system. Is that fair to say? 
I I think so. I think there's yeah, there's sort of a a, a disconnect that almost has to happen. Um, although I would say, you know, as, as I've been going through the went up through the quantum biology certification, I have been able to sort of incorporate that, and it's helped me sort of reframe how I put things to my patients, uh, you know, especially like in just an urgent care setting, it's a little tricky. You've really got a finite amount of time to establish rapport and then try to blow yeah. their minds with some new information. <laughs> um, but, you know, that the, the certification really helped me with that and, and bringing that into the fold a little bit and just sort of introducing it in little bits. Um, but also, too, it's given me tools that, uh, you know, so one of the things kind of going back again that I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't really even... Um, get to was in terms of treating people, you know, there's, I've, I've always, I've been seeking something that I can give to people. That's not a drug. That's a little more holistic because all of these things, uh, you know, in conventional medicine, they're trying to pinpoint a single problem, an ion channel or, or some, you know, mm. or a specific type of cell or their a specific function within a cell. And, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. So you change this one little thing and it's going to change 20 other things. And, yeah. and you've got to address that. So then that's where we end up with like, well, here's a drug for this. And then here's a right. drug for the side effects of that drug. And then right. here's a drug for those side effects. <laughs> and because you know, there's any time you, and you, you do some kind of external intervention on the body, there's going to be downstream effects. Exactly. And then the people who've created that one specific intervention only looked at that one specific thing. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You have some scientists that has, you know, devoted their life to, um, you know, a glial cell uh, or even, you know, a, a molecule, you know, one amino acid. And and they know that amino acid inside and out, uh, but then they sort of lose the forest for the trees and right. and, and don't think about all the uh, additional effects. But, you know, doing, you know, talking about circadian biology and light therapy and things like that is a little more holistic. And especially if you talk about ways to kind of get that naturally as opposed to, you know, you know, light panels and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. I mean, if you need them, you need them, but if you can do this naturally, then that's even better. And then, and there's more and more studies coming out about that sort of stuff, especially when you talk about brain health or mental health, um, you know, concepts of like tree bathing or, yes. or like, you know, just getting outside and natural therapy like that. And so you having that, that sort of tool has been really important for me uh, to try to help my patients, my clients in, right. in terms of, of improving their health and their wellness. And how do you find it's landing? Cause I, I feel like sometimes the, the practical applications of understanding sort of the, the body from a, a quantum perspective, or even a circadian perspective, like the practical end results of, okay, so what do I do are so simple that sometimes people are like, what? just that yeah <laughs> it, yeah it, it's interesting it varies for sure so of course there are people that are in a place where they're sort of so for la for lack of a better way of putting it, they're desperate right yeah and they've mm -hmm. tried everything else and it's failed them so they're very receptive they'll just they're try like, anything okay whatever yeah um, and that's you know, when so we that's... like i it's for me what i've came to see it as the gift of desperation, right? It's like, sure. <laughs> I, all right, I'm willing to give up all the things I think I know and I think I should do and I love that. Just tell me, just tell me, Yeah, I'll do anything. Yeah. But even that can be tricky because in those cases, sometimes you find, so they're, they have put so much weight on it and so much pressure on it. And that, that sort of limits, you know, the effectiveness or the ability to receive uh, the information. You mean so, on the inf put so much weight on the in on the idea of having a solution? Yeah, exactly. Right. So yes. so it's it's still a little bit. Um, I hesitate to say management of expectations, but mm -hmm. uh, patience and intention yes. with these sorts of things, right? Um, yes, and that's and an also a downstream effect of the pill of all of the pharmaceutical culture, right? Is like we do expect it instantly. Exactly. Like yeah. if I have an infection and I take antibiotics, like within 24 hours, I like it's on the way out. Sure. So, but yes, when we come at it from more holistic things, it does take, it is a more gradual process, but we've also been trained mentally to. Exactly. Yeah. And that, so that's now. something across yeah. the board, whoever you come across is there's this expectation of expediency and yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, you know, the best things come to those who wait. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, so then on, you know, I think on the other spectrum, I think there's, there's 
you know, the, the term woo always comes up, right, in, mm -hmm. the, in our discussions. And, uh, you know, so I think there's, there's people that are just, they're too um, indoctrinated into the, the modern, you know, we've got all this technological advances and we can create all these medications. So, you know, they really kind of bought into the technological science side of things, which has its merits. But, you know, yes. there's some things that we can't explain. And something I always sort of go back to is like, all this stuff is still theory. All this stuff is just, you know, our best guess of what's actually going on based on the information we have. But yeah, we, we won't really know until we can, you know, do the fantastic voyage thing and shrink ourselves down to the size <laughs> of being able to see atoms and neutrons and, you know, quarks and ups and downs, um, you know, until then, you know, the, the view we have of things is, um, is really sort of manufactured, right? You know, talking about yeah. looking at something microscopically. Um, so, and, you know, it has its merits, but you still have to understand that it's, it's limitations. It's not, we're not really seeing, you know, what's happening in nature, you know, down at the cellular level or the molecular level. And, um, so, and I, and so I, I sort of try it. So, so the patients that are the people that are really sort of skeptical and like, Oh, that's, that's woo. That's, that's sort of the thing I talk to them about. And I sort of explain to them in, in, in scientific terms, you know, the yeah. layout, like, well, do you know what happens when your blood is drawn? Like they're not just looking at the blood it's spun down and it's separated out and they take this part out and that part out, and then they throw a bunch of chemicals in it. So how, you know, how do you, so I explained that whole process to them and, um, you know, and that helps, that helps them say, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, okay, this may be valid, but there's some limitations to this information now. So then that opens their mind a little bit right? and they want to hear a little more about something different, maybe. Okay. Or so then, also... what, then what do you tell them? So they're okay. <laughs> our minds are open. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, so, so then, and so then maybe I'll, I'll say, so to the best of our knowledge, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about photons and light and how the mitochondria works, for example, and that it's, and, and sort of change the, the, my, the, the frame of the mitochondria. Like we just think of it as a factory, but it's so much more, there's so much going on in there. And, you know, if we talk about the electron transport chain, I don't want to get too deep here, but, yeah, go for um, it. <laughs> but you know, basically this, and, and this is probably about the limit I go to, I say, mm -hmm. well, there's this process where you've got a, a line of electrons and you know what, you know, what's the corollary to that? Well, it's like the electricity going through your wires and it's what's happening there. Well, that's becoming a battery now. It's not just making ATP, which then, you know, is blown up to make a little burst of energy and you blow up a million ATP to make more energy. No, there's something else happening here potentially that, and, and again, it's theory, right? We don't mm -hmm. know for sure, but it's kind of an interesting idea, especially when you think about, well, how much energy does our body use, you know, yeah. through the day? Like, yes. To me, do, just doing the thought experiment on it is, it just doesn't make sense that you're just breaking up a bunch of ATPs all the time. Like that process takes time. Like how do you, you know, move your arm up real quick or whatever? Right. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that, that biochemical explanation isn't quick enough yeah. to, to explain all of the functions that are happening in a body, like every second that we're living. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and so that sort of opens up their mind to, and then, so that's where they start to say, yeah, you're right. Like this is kind of, okay, maybe there is something else happening here. So maybe I need to do something else to charge my battery, so to speak, right. um, and, and, and start doing it. And then, and then, you know, the other thing too, is I'll even just break it down a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, what are the tangible effects of going outside? Even if you don't go barefoot, you know, <laughs> it, or whatever, just, I yeah. mean, just being outside, being in nature, you know, away from the sounds of a city or traffic or whatever, it just, changes your mind. And there, that's actually, there is an immediate effect there. I mean, it's maybe mm -hmm. not going to heal all your achy joints instantly, but, you know, if you s stop to think about it, you know, in that moment, there's a change in your mind and you're, you know, you're more relaxed. Maybe you're thinking a little more positively or happily, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about things. And so there is, you, and, and so you start to focus on those sorts of things and say, okay, well, here's some immediate change. And, and then, so, and then they recognize that and they say, okay, well, I think I can keep doing this. 
right. and then they keep doing it. And then they'll see some bigger changes, right? Right. Some, yeah. And the, I mean, the changes are, and it's quite profound. And then people mm-hmm. are like, I'm feeling this much better just from like going for a walk every day yeah. <laughs> outside without a hat on. <laughs> yeah. Unless so. it's blazing hot, then you can wear a hat in the winter. And yeah. that was a big, that was a big piece too, that that was a huge thing for me to learn is that I kind of, I didn't even realize I had this sort of embedded belief from growing up in Canada and then, you know, living at high latitudes a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I just had this idea that winter was going to de- be depressing and uh-huh. hard. And that's when you got sick and sad and all these things. And then I, you know, interviewed people in this space and they're like, no, you just need to spend time outside. And we don't <laughs> because it's <Exactly>. cold. <laughs> so exactly. yes, this idea of of nature as a healing mechanism, and there's quite a lot of research on that. You were t- we were talking before we started about tree bathing or forest bathing, or yep. Um, and there's so there's the grounding aspect, there's the light aspect. So what, like, what is happening to us? <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> good or bad? What do you mean? <laughs> so when we walk outside, yeah, what's happening to us? Why do we feel so much better? And um, over the long term, even be able to heal things. So to the first question, I mean that's that's sort of the magic of it. We don't know. I you know I I wouldn't profess to say exactly what's happening. Um, I think I think that's where, so that's the beauty of quantum biology. Like this is, uh, I mean, to just sort of put it into context, um, you know, b- before I was going, you know, when I was pre-med or pre-pre-med, I thought, oh, you know, I want to learn, I'm going to learn nutrition and I'm going to, that's what I thought mm-hmm. I was going to learn in med school, for example. I'm like, nutrition's important. Yeah. And, and, but I didn't. Now maybe no. they're starting to learn nutrition, but now I think, you know, from what we've been learning here, it's like, well, maybe nutrition is a little bit secondary. There's a lot of other factors there. So now I think the thing that's not being taught in med school, I mean, nutrition probably still isn't really being taught in med school, but um, it's getting a little more attention. But now that I think the next thing is quantum biology. And so mm-hmm. that's what we've got to figure out. I there, I, There's just, uh, a, it's tough to say exactly what it is, but, yeah. you know, I think it's, pretty i feel that it's pretty obvious that there's a connection i don't know it's you know i don't know about telepathy or anything like that but to, you know not to that level all right but there's okay. absolutely you're a- an md i understand <laughs> <laughs> hey i'm, I'm very open-minded if somebody <laughs> data for me i'm all yours i you know i'm absolutely that's one thing i've really learned i mean i've always tried to keep an open mind but especially in the last few years i've just been you know super open-minded about any information coming in and and thinking okay well i'll take this in i'm i absolutely will hear this um and uh you know so i think there's oh, right so the yeah. so the intersection of physics and biology correct yeah i think so and it, and even back to the example of energy use and and how we move and all that like how does this happen so quickly and so you know, and we're recharged and ready to do it again. So <clears throat> I think there's a there's a quantum explanation for that, and and we'll get there hopefully. Um, but then again, maybe there's even one step beyond that. Yeah. You know, that will that somebody more advanced than us will figure out in 500 years from now. But probably, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're at the beginning <laughs> of the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> somebody else will. Yeah. Uh, tell us we were all wrong, but. <laughs> Yeah, but so I think there's some some sort of connection as far as just uh, some on some level there's a communication with the environment, and that's and we're meant we're animals we're meant to be mm-hmm. outside yeah. in that environment, and so we surround ourselves with more and more unnatural things, right. and we're just disconnecting ourselves from that. So um, just our our quarks and our electrons and our protons and our neutrons. They know something, yeah, and they they know where they belong, and right. uh, you know, and, and they're not they're not in the right place, you know, when we're just sort of right. So when we when confine we ourselves to a man to a man made environment with 
artificial temperatures and artificial light and artificial frequencies at a certain point, our cells are going to rebel. And then when we put ourselves in a natural environment, which as you were saying, like where they're meant to be and they understand the frequency of all of that, they understand the frequencies that are coming at them and it makes sense. And they're Mm -hmm. in like a communicative flow. Exactly. It you said that way better than I did. Enhances health. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just laid it out yeah. for me. That's what I do. I like I just repeat back what people say. They're like, oh, that was really good. I'm like, well, no, that's what you said. <laughs> yeah. So and it's so you know, just it just came to me. If you want a a less woo explanation of it, is I should try to stop using that word. Sorry. No, um, I love it. I'm all <laughs> and so I, love I the just woo. I just finished reading a book uh called We Are Electric by Sally Adie, I'll give her a shout out because I think it was a really good book. And so Great. it really outlines all the, um, I, I think, you know, the. I was hoping she would get in more into quantum and maybe I was hoping that maybe I'd recognize a few other names like in our circles that, uh, you know, have been working on this, but she didn't quite get there. But, uh, you know, it was a great sort of historical explanation in, in kind of discovery of how electricity works in our bodies. And kind of one oh, of the cool. key points is, you know, we've, obviously you think about nerve cells and nerve conduction and that you know mm-hmm. what we've learned anyway is that it's you know it's the ion channels and they open and close and uh you know and that conducts an electrical impulse um and again i kind of just digress a little and say well how does that i mean you're talking about like ions you know fluid flowing in and out of a cell you know a million times a, a second essentially to do this how could that actually work? Um, there must be something right. else, right? Or even right. as an aside, why is it that it's based on potassium and calcium and chloride ion, uh, and sodium ions? Why not electrons? You know, so there maybe there's mm-hmm. some there's got to be something else to it. And depending on the cell, this one might use calcium, that one might use sodium. So there's got to be something deeper happening there, in my mind. Um, but anyway, back to the point is, so we think about nerves, we think about the brain, you know, you can read an EEG, the, the brain puts off an electrical signal, the heart puts off an electrical signal when you do an EKG. Um, but every cell has an electrical current. They, mm-hmm. Like it's a signature. They're all a little different, you know, anywhere from, you know, minus 10 to minus 70 millivolts. And so, you know, why do we have that why why is it so there's this electrical current there's this magnet and that creates an emf an electromagnetic field right so we have our electromagnetic signature and how could that not be impacted by outside electromagnetic frequencies you know um again i won't go so far as telepathy yet (laughs) but you know if you're in your wired house or you're next to your microphone you got your cell phone next to your head um those they're putting out EMFs, EMF uh, electromagnetic fields too. Yes, almost being doubly pluralized. But uh, you know, so how do those not interact and have some sort of impact? And right. so, you know, getting out into nature kind of has would end up presenting you with more congruous electromagnetic fields, right? Because right. every every cell in a plant has it too. Um, you know, in the grass or in a tree or in other animals. And then, of course, there's the big magnetic field that we're living in. That, you know, the entire Earth has a magnetic field. So, um, you know, those are the things we're used to. And maybe we can sort of adapt and acclimate to unusual ones. And that's probably what has happened to some extent over the years. Yeah. But I think everybody's a little different and everybody has a different level of sensitivity to yeah. those sorts of things. And then that's where we end up trying to deal with all sorts of different problems. Yes. Yeah. And it's so interesting, you know, because it's, it's well established in the, you know, that, that, you know, we've been doing EKGs for years. It's well established that there's those frequencies coming out, but it's somehow there's a brick wall to say that there well, wouldn't they naturally then be interacting with the frequencies coming out of say like this phone. <laughs> it's yeah, like, exactly. It's like, Oh no, no. Mm-mm. I remember one time a, a few years ago, uh, the New York Times tweeted 
some really snarky headline about how if you believed that your phone was bad for you, you had been a victim of like a Russian disinformation campaign. And I was sitting there and I was literally like, I saw that tweet on Twitter. And I was like, at that very moment, I had open on my computer, a tab to that huge big study that came out in I think 2018. Mm -hmm. That I forget the name of it. If you remember, tell me it was like a it was a longitudinal longitudinal study looking at the effects of EMF on human health. And it was like yeah. absolutely conclusive that A, yeah. it affected human health and B, not in a good way. And yeah. I had that open up my computer and I was looking at this tweet from the New York Times. So I I responded and I was like, well, actually, I'm, there's some research I'm looking at right here with, with scientists from all over the world <laughs> who, are, who are making a different conclusion. Um, and they deleted it. And that was, that was my, this was back in 2018. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> so I guess. The Ministry of Disinformation I thought again. they were, I still at that time <laughs> thought they would be interested in a dialogue. Yeah. I now realize I was naive on that front. <laughs> but then, so that's why later when things happen and people are like, why don't you trust the media? I was like, well, I think they don't care about the truth in certain situations. But anyway, that's another story. Yeah. My point, my point being like, there's, there are things that are not like quantum biology is definitely out on the fringes. If you said that to any doctor in the world, they'd be like, what are you even talking about? Yeah. And yet there are things that are accepted that would make it very obvious that certain things in our lives are unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, and it, they, they just like, won't go there. Um, which leads me to 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 my next question. So, as as a sports uh, medicine mm -hmm. expert, um, I know that you saw obviously like a lot of concussions. Yep. And so, I wanted to talk about concussions and brain health, and if there are ways using what we understand about how the body really works to mm -hmm. make ourselves perhaps more resilient to the more detrimental effects of a concussion. Yeah. Um, but first, like just, you know, for, for our audience, just sort of say what, what a concussion is. Sure. Yeah. So, so the whole idea about, so what a concussion is, and even this is sort of changing, but really the idea is that the, so the brain, so think about a bowl of jelly, you know, float or a, a chunk of jello floating in water. Okay. Um, mostly a big chunk of jello and a little bit of water in the bowl, you know, and this and the okay. water will sort of displace around it. Um <clears throat> so that's so that's what we're dealing with. So it's 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 this, you know, kind of squishy mass that's so the jello is my brain. Correct. What's and, the water? And, and then it's bathed in cerebrospinal fluid. So okay. Um and we can go all all day long about what that actually is, but um, at a minimum, it's it's this sort of crystalline sort of water solution that helps sort of cushion the brain in inside your skull and also maybe nourish it. It has a little sugar and glucose in it and can help with some nutrient exchange and all that. Okay. So uh, so and basically, we will, we will circle back to the CSF so, then. To the um, okay. The um, so that's so that's what we have, and it's it's sort of a cushion to kind of protect the brain. Uh, what happens in a concussion is it's usually sort of a, it, it doesn't even have to be, a, the tricky thing with concussion is it doesn't even have to be a direct impact. So we always think about somebody falling and hitting their head. Um, but it doesn't always ha have to happen that way. It can be just a really fast, like stopping fast in a car and mm -hmm. where it, and the term is coup contra coup. So the, you know, the, the head kind of moves one way and the, the you know, acceleration and deceleration forces so your head starts moving but since your brain is sort of floating in space is it ends up sort of hitting the back of your skull so your head moves forward your your brain takes a second to start moving forward too and actually ends up bashing on the back of your skull or vice versa or it happens oh, both ways. Like, you know, i see head, head forward and back and your so brain your skull doesn't actually hit anything but you can jiggle your you can smash exactly. your brain up so against the back of your skull you have, just by Okay. Yeah, if you have enough of a acceleration or deceleration yeah. that alone could be uh, could cause a concussion. Um, and I and then the other challenge too is when you think about sports, is um, 
and, and maybe not truly concussion, but in terms of the, the sequelae of concussion, when you talk about CTE, chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy, things like that, okay. is you have a, a bunch of built up micro concussive forces or, or mm -hmm. micro trauma forces built up over time. So you think football, American football, and, you know, repeat yes. it, or even soccer heading the ball, if you're heading the ball a lot, things like that, you know, those sorts of things may cause some, some difficulties. Um, and so that's, so that's the injury in, in, in a nutshell is, is uh, probably the best way to think about it is, is a bruise. The, okay. the kind of the simple way to think of it's like a concussion would be a bruise versus, you know, if you have actual tearing of nerves uh, and that sort of thing, those would be kind of progressively more severe injuries. And then, um, so it's got kind of a bruise. And then what happens afterwards in terms of healing and allowing that bruise to heal, it, you know, sort of dictates symptoms in the long term. Okay. Like and so start... what, what would, what are the, the common symptoms sort of for a mild concussion and then for something? So, yeah, so the, 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 the common things would be, uh, you know, sort of a brain fog, sort of a difficulty with focus or concentration, mm -hmm. might be some visual. So like light sensitivity, especially in early stages is a big one. And we can talk about that it gets tricky when we talk about the treatments that I like to try to do um, to try to balance that. So light sensitivity or even difficulty with focus. So you, you might lose near focus or far focus or it, it lags and takes a little while. So those would be kind of the common things, headache, of course, um, sometimes nausea or vomiting. And it may depend on your, you know, where on the brain that the injury happened to. And then, you know, just as an aside, because I mentioned nausea and vomiting, um, you know, just as a, a, a heads up to people, you know, a, a cautionary or a, uh, this is that there's, you know, if you have a head injury and you're having really severe symptoms, so the, the things that say just weren't going and getting checked out because you could have a concussion, but you could also have a brain bleed or a skull fracture or both. And okay. those are, are more serious and those are an emergency situation. So, you know, you got to get checked out, of course. Um, but, you know, things like intractable vomiting, just if you can't, you know, you're throwing up continually or severe headache, okay. a disorientation. So it's one thing to kind of have a little trouble with concentration, but if you're just not, you know, if you're talking to somebody and they're not kind of picking you up at all, you know, those are your, your real warning signs to get checked out right away. Um, okay. And uh, so, so those would be the, the sort of the common symptoms. And then of course, long-term it, it's often, it's the sun ends up being the same symptoms, but they just sort of don't go away. Um, you know, so especially thinking about difficulty with focus or even exertional issues. So, it, um, or men, like mental exertion. So maybe you're fine when you start reading a book, but five pages in, you start getting a headache uh, mm. sort of thing. And so that would be kind of like a, a cognitive exertion effect that um, may be a result of concussion or long-term, you know, post-concussive syndrome. Okay. And so what is the sort of like traditional way of healing or helping to support the healing of concussions and, and other types of brain injuries. And what have you added to your protocols with your understanding of, of light and EMFs sure. and things like that? So it's kind of a, the, the real old school way was like total brain rest. We thought, okay, well, we need to like, just like if you, you know, break your leg, well, you've got to splint it and set it and cast it, okay. and, you know, hold it still and let it heal. And, and so the brain version of that was, uh, you know, isolation and, uh, you know, dark room, you know, no light. Well, because the light hurts. So right. touch, shut off the lights um, and and all that. And that probably, that's too far because it turns okay. out. So actually one other thing I didn't, I forgot to mention in terms of symptoms. And, you know, this is an important one, I think in general is mental health, depressive symptoms a lot of times. Mm. But in a way, a lot of times that's actually a secondary thing because of, you know, you've got this weird injury that's a little bit nebulous. And, uh, and you know, especially say we talk about, kids and their sports yeah. yeah they're concussed and then we're like nope you gotta we shepherd you away and you put you in a dark room and you aren't communicating right. with your team and your friends maybe you're not going to school uh you know and then that that really can snowball pretty quickly so that was kind of the old way and, and you know from, 
fortunately kind of figured that out and realized, okay, well, there's sort of a balance and a relative rest. And so it's more like a sprain where, okay, well, you don't want to overdo it, mm -hmm. but you got to start working that ankle sooner okay. rather than later. And so, you know, just sort of do some kind of mindful observation, maybe work in, you know, let them still go to, you know, talking about kids mostly. Right. Um, yeah is let them go to school, but maybe you make sure they have accommodations where they can take breaks. Uh, maybe they go half day for a while, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then on the treatment side, you know, you would do different things for treatment. Um, you, and, and this is where you kind of get into pharmacology and doing Tylenol or Motrin. Um, and, uh, you know, I should use the generics, right? acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Uh, but yet again, you know, be careful. Ibuprofen can, promote bleeding. So if you have a bleed, you mm -hmm. don't want to be taking ibuprofen and, you know, treating the headache, things like that. Um, you know, sometimes you know, nausea medicines and all, and, um, and then to try to just kind of manage symptoms, antidepressants. If, so I really don't like doing that. I, that. I mean, that's what I used to do. I really don't like using medications kind of at all anymore. I mean, in a pinch, I suppose. I don't, I wouldn't chastise yeah. somebody for doing that, for using a medication if they were really uncomfortable. But what, um, so now what I really try to do is kind of the more natural methods and like, let's really focus on, uh, you know, good light therapy and all that and see if we can kind of get things under control that way. Um, and uh, so then there are some other sort of supplemental things that I do. So back to, activity. So I usually encourage people to actually try to get walking. And, and this is sort of a secret method of getting them into light therapy too. So, you know, <laughs> right. go, go walking outside, right? And so light activity, light exercise, walk, don't run, you know, let your symptoms be your guide as far as like, if you're starting to, you know, um, you know, start power walking and then you start getting a headache. Okay. Well, you got to back off. And, uh, and then preferably, of course you do it outside and then you happen to be getting some light exposure as well. Right. And, um, and, and then there's certain you know, in supplements too, I sort of treat as drugs, you know, there may be mm -hmm. some merit, but uh, it's the same idea as like, you're taking like a single molecule. So in the case of concussion, it would be omega-3 fatty acids uh, right. supplementation. So that can be really important because we use omega-3 fatty acids to kind of build up the myelin sheaths, the insulating sheaths in our, in our brain around our nerve cells and all that. So there's, there's method to that theory. Okay. Well, we need to kind of boost that. Uh, so if we can do it with diet, that would be best. So seafood, but, um, maybe an omega-3 supplement would be another thing to consider there. Um, and so then, so then the next thing I would be, okay, well, let's talk about kind of light therapy. So the, the, the screen, like the iPad, the, the tablet or the phone, that sort of thing is sort of a double whammy on this sort of thing, because one, it can be a little bit overstimulating, you know, if, if we're trying mm -hmm. to sort of give the brain a little bit of a break, but then two, it's all this unnatural blue light um, that uh, has adverse effects in terms of our, our, our internal battery health, kind of stripping electrons and depleting electrons, but also two, it's, um, you know, if you're not outside, if you're just bathed in kind of unnatural light, you're not getting red light. And then this kind of gets back to, you know, talking about CSF yeah. and, and at least kind of theoretically what makes sense to me. I don't know that this is really borne out, but um, one, I think one of the, so what we haven't, what conventional medicine hasn't really caught up to, and hopefully we will, is that, you know, there's this kind of healing in effect in terms of, of of red light of the red light end of the spectrum and and how and how that sort of kind of organizes our cellular structures and and the fluids around them and and that's and that ends up being really important because that helps kind of the battery run efficiently um and so what the brain how would the brain get red light because it's kind of encased in this thick skull mm -hmm. and so how does it how could it possibly get there well you know i i think for one thing, you've got some thin portions of bone. So the, the temples, there's a very thin portion of bone there uh, that actually could probably transmit some light. So there's that. But then also um, through the eyes, directly through the eyes, it's a direct connection to your brain. And and then you've got the CSF. And, and I think that there's something to the, the CSF that it 
sort of operates like a fiber optic cable and can help mm. transmit light. And then you're bathing your entire brain um, with red spectrum, you know, uh, red and infrared spectrum light uh, to uh, help with healing for your brain. And so that's, that's where okay. I kind of want to get into that. So you try to cut the blue light. So in terms of putting it into practice, yeah. one is kind of cut the screens, you know, you really shut, you know, cut down the screen time um, for a lot of reasons, getting outside more. Um, sleep hygiene, I think is really important um, for healing because, you know, sleep is when your body does all its rebuilding and repair. Uh, and especially for your brain, uh, it's really important. Uh, and so then that's another kind of side effect of the light. So light uh, signals our uh, sleep and wake cycle, right? So, yeah. um, you know, and blue light tends to be sort of a wake up signal. And so you want, you want kind of want that blue light in the morning and it, but it, like right then and there, it's sort of flipping the hourglass. And so you get that, you get a kind of a wake up signal in the morning and it's sort of setting your clock for the day. As long as you're getting the right light through the rest of the day, right? That, okay, well, I'm going to be tired. But then, you know, what happens is we kind of after a long day at school or at work or whatever, we plop down in front of a big LED TV or our <laughs> screen or our tablets and that sort of thing. And we give ourselves another hit of blue light of another wake up signal right before bed. And that disrupts our sleep. So, you know, I try to lay that out and explain that to the patients and say, okay, well, this is what you need to do in terms of, you know, just try to get your the light right to help your sleep and, right. and that's going to help you recover. You know, what you need is that you, you need rest. So you need activity and you need rest and you need a balance of both. And the rest part of the big, big part of it is the sleep. That's when the rebuilding really happens. Um, you know, you don't want to overdo the activity side of it during the day. So you need that rest during the day, but you really need it at night. And so we right. need to put things in place for, for people to get good sleep at night and good consistent sleep. Right. It's so interesting. I'm thinking I did, I did an interview with um, Dr. Michael Twyman, who's a cardiologist and it's mm -hmm. like, how, what's the best way to prevent, you know, adverse cardiac events. And he's mm -hmm. like, get high quality sleep. Right. And I'm talking yeah. to you. It's like, what's the best way to heal traumatic brain injury or have a brain that's resilient. So if it does get a little banged, it's maybe not going to go be um as harmed and it's like get good high quality sleep <laughs> I talked to yeah. and it just it's just so so important. Okay. So good high quality sleep, natural light signals during the day, darkness at night. Let's now circle back to to the infrared and the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So we can get infrared light by going outside mm -hmm. and we can get infrared light by using a device that emits infrared light. Yep. And then what is it what is it doing? So you talked about you talked about it a little bit, but like let's go in. So it there it goes in through the eyes, it goes in through the thinner bones. And then that's that cerebral spinal through it connects with the infrared light. What's what's happening? So one of the things so what I'm it, basically it, there's this concept of structured water. So and what we want to talk about is the uh, the CSF. And I think the CSF probably is structured water. We think of it as this like sugar solution, but it's probably ideally anyway, structured water. And right. and the, the whole concept behind structured water is that it, it creates um, an electrical gradient and sort of makes a battery right. <laughs> and, and yeah. helps all our other batteries, like our mitochondria batteries all run a little more efficiently. And so that's, that's sort of the idea. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the uh, the expert to talk to about the details of it, but the uh, that's sort of the idea. So, and you mm -hmm. can expose, you, you, there's you can see the experiments where you know exposure to infrared light, exposing a water solution to it, gets it organized into this zone, and all the positive charges start to kind of accumulate more to one side than the other, and it and it becomes this sort of electrical gradient. Um, so that's that's what's happening. Uh, on the and the bigger picture level, and you know, at least theoretically, what we do is what it's doing for us is is creating that battery and facilitating flow of electrons and electricity, and uh, and and making our batteries work. <laughs> wow! So that that cerebral spinal fluid is what did you call it earlier? Like the superconductor? Uh, a fiber optic. 
Fiber optic. <laughs> fiber, that's, that's, it, so yeah. So it, and then it basically, I think, so if you have it, if it's organized in a, you know, consistent fashion, then right. it's able to to um, uh, conduct light more effectively and more efficiently. If it's just a bunch of random particles floating around, it, your light's just going to bounce all over the place and, and and maybe not get to its intended target. But if you have it kind of, if it sort of knows, basically putting it, structuring your water mm -hmm. gives the, you know, the, the your gives the map, creates the map, and then your the infrared light light photons kind of know where to go. They know what, how to deal with that and get where they right. need to go. So the infrared light is structuring the cerebral spinal fluid yep. so it can be more effective and efficient. Yep. Yeah. And so, and then, you know, if at the cellular level, so if that infrared light is helping to, is structuring the water within the mitochondria um, or in within the cells, same idea is helping them run more efficiently. And so that then facilitates healing. And what's the, what is the, um, the research like and the general sort of acceptance of this kind of inf light therapy on concussions? Like I've just been hearing from, different people in the community that uh, athletes are really starting to, professional athletes are really starting to embrace it. Um, what's your sense of that? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's starting to come around. I think, you know, I, as far as the exact mechanism, I mean, this is just sort of my, my theory, my thought experiment on it. Um, but uh, I think it's probably some something along what we'll along the lines of what we'll figure out. So yeah. there's it's it's in its infancy. It's an early thing. You know, there's a, a few different sort of devices out there and all that. And and there's more research and more acceptance of that. Um, I think it started probably with you know a lot of doing a lot of infrared therapy with musculoskeletal injuries and sort of realizing okay, well there's this in big picture there's this anti-inflammatory effect of red light. Okay, well let's start throw a red light at everything, wherever right. there's inflammation, let's throw a red light at it and see what happens. And, you know, so in terms of my, you know, my practice philosophy, kind of that is almost the same idea as, you know, taking a drug for a problem or a supplement for a problem. Right. So you got to be a little careful, although I'm, I'm hopeful because I, you know, I feel like at least on some level that, you know, a, a healthy light, a light therapy is less invasive than a, a chemical that, you know, creates, you know, a million down, uh, downstream effects. Right. So, but that's where I really love the idea of trying to get it naturally. So the way I always put that is like, your body knows exactly how much it needs of everything, you know? So if you give it a natural source of something, uh, it will take what it needs and, you know, just deflect what it doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, get rid of what it doesn't, you know, as you ingest, you know, if you eat, a, you know, a bunch of oranges. Well, it'll take all the item, vitamin C it needs, but you'll pee out all the vitamin C you don't need. And that's just fine. Um, and I think right. that sort of the same thing with light. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, you, if we don't know, you know, I, it's possible, it's possible that with an unnatural, you know, or a man-made infrared light that our body will deflect what it doesn't need, but it's possible that we might give ourselves too much of a good thing and right. cause other problems. And so I, that's where I think, you know, hopefully the research is sort of heading is, okay, well, let's, can we fine tune this? And can we figure out like, you know, what's the safe dose? What's the effective dose? What's the dangerous yes. dose? Or if there is one. Right. Yeah. And I've certainly heard that too. It's like in front, yeah, using those red light devices, like the rule of thumb is kind of tends to be about 20 minutes because mm -hmm. exactly to your point, there are, um, you know, health enthusiasts where they're like, oh, this is, this is good for me that I'll do it all day long. And it's like, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, that's not necessarily how it works Yeah, or like, oh, it, you know, this type of tea is good. I'll drink it all day long. It's like, no, one cup, one cup of it, <laughs> one right. cup is okay. One cup will give yeah. you the benefit you need. Um, so yeah, we do. Yeah. I think that's just part of our, our human nature to get a little overzealous. So that's good. Yeah. It, it's good to, to remember that it's, yeah. Well, you, you know, and, and I th limits on things. Yeah. Except think, being outside. I don't know that we need yeah, to put a I, limit on that unless we're getting exactly, sunburned yeah. and then you want to go in the shade, but. 
Right. Other than that, yeah. But even that, you know, is, talking about sunburn or something is your your again perfect example, right? Your body tells you like, yeah. hey, you're, you're, you're getting right. warm here. Okay, I've hit um, my dose. <laughs> let's, let's you know move into I'm some shade. I'm thinking up, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, so there, right? So there's that, and I think too with with light is, um, it, it again, you know, just like you try to isolate one vitamin or one molecule or something to to create a treatment same same goes for light you know it's a whole big spectrum and including not just the light we can see right but it's i mean right up to uh, you know ionizing radiation and and heat uh you know that you don't see and we do need all of them so it's you know we talk about you know we so focus on blue light it almost sounds like that we're saying blue light's bad and it's like no blue light is good in the right time in the right dose right. and and same goes for red light so they all work together and as we you know if we try to kind of pinpoint and say okay well this is the good one and this is the one we need and we're gonna dose it up well if we might miss something it might be that well we need mostly red light but maybe we need a little bit of yellow mixed in and a little bit of blue as well and uh so basically right. all that to say you can't go wrong by going outside um yeah. and, right. and a lot it's, of that yeah yeah, the I, sun I, always has the perfect mix, the yeah. perfect combination. <laughs> yeah. And and then, you know, especially when you talk you're talking about, you know, the non-visible spectra because we're talking about infrared, which is not visible, or we're talking about UV on the other end, you know, those are kind of I mean, it depends a little bit on season and sun height in the sky and all that. But you know, all that aside, like they're always there. It's not that you like I've got a really gray day where I am right now in upstate New York. Um you know, just because I can't see the sun doesn't mean I'm not getting some very important wavelengths of light yeah. to nourish myself. So, you know, it's it's not about necessarily getting the sun. Of course, maybe it's a little easier and nicer, but, um, you know, it, it's it's just the, that, that light is there in kind of the perfect mix kind of all the time. Um, right. And, and especially for kind of what you're acclimated to, right? So, we're, you know, or I'm acclimated to this light environment. Yeah. So I'm getting what I need from this light environment. And if I take a trip down to Florida in a couple of weeks, um, I'm not, I wish I was, but <laughs> I would be really at risk of, you know, when you talk about sunburn, like mm -hmm. I would probably burn really quickly, maybe right. even quicker than my body signals tell me right. and, and warn me because they're just not acclimated. They're not, you know, ready for that. Um, and so, and that's sort of, I'd say the sort of the corollary to trying to isolate a wavelength and, and fix it is like, well, you've got the, the light you want to, your, your body is sort of already attuned to what it can deal with and what it can work with. Right. Yeah, it's true. It's such an important point. And, and, you know, I just, when I learned about how healing winter sunlight could be. <laughs> I just, it was, it was almost like a mystical experience because I felt like my whole life I'd had this idea that, you know, as I was saying before, like, oh, this season is bad for you or something. Yeah. And it just was really a moment where I was like, no, like, like nature takes care of us. Like, and we're part of nature. And if we, if we understand that and, and live in a way that respects that there's, there's, it's there's no season that's bad for us. Like we're, we get what we yeah. need, as you're saying, like our bodies will pull what they need from their environment. If that environment is natural. Yeah. Well, see, I, I'd um, like to offer a reframe for that. I please, for, for those of us in kind of higher latitudes, we are actually at an advantage because of that, because we have this built in natural cycle of kind of a, a rest a time for rest, mm. time for rebuilding. So, you know, if you think about, um, you know, diet and and, eat and and being able to kind of rebuild and regenerate and, and maybe going into a cycle of ketosis or something like that, like we, it's naturally built in for us. If we allow it, we don't, you know, conventional right. modern society, you know, tries to make everything even Steven all the time. But, you know, if you kind of allow for it, um, you know, this is a, a natural opportunity as I'm heading into winter, like, okay, maybe I should start, you know, doing more, you know, more of a ketogenic diet, or I'm going to, and I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I pretty conscientiously, I mean, I usually stay up pretty late, but, you know, I kind of wake up with the sunrise 
And, um, you know, and so taking advantage of this opportunity, like, oh yeah, well, there's not a lot of days, of hours of light. Well, okay, that's fine. And, yeah. you know, so we have this natural opportunity to, if we'll accept it, is try to have a several months to sort of rest and rebuild and regenerate and then kind of get back into action as the, as the, you mm -hmm. know, spring comes and the plants bloom and, and all that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's true. It's a great way to look at it. And like, when you do live sort of a circadian optimized lifestyle, like you move, you know, we move you move dinner earlier, you move bedtime earlier. So it's actually not depressing that it's, that it's pitch dark at five o'clock because like, I'm probably going to be in bed in a few hours. Right. <laughs> like, right. Whereas if it's, I'm, you know, I, I keep my schedule the same all year round and it's like, Oh, I have, I have like all of these things to do. And like when it's still dark out mm -hmm. and that's, it's funny too. You're talking about kids activities. That's one thing like that I, I find is a little challenging in the winter, right. Is like they, they're out like doing gymnastics exactly. or taekwondo or, <laughs> under brightly lit fluorescent lights it's you know 6 30 uh, in january exactly. like it's been dark for two hours yeah but yeah no, but i see and do? i think <laughs> you, can, you can sort of mitigate those things so because that is i mean that's that's the challenge right so you you've you've got to so depending on you know the extreme you want to go to you might have to say like well to heck with it i've really got to do this for for my health but you know for most of us it's fine and you know and i think there's ways to mitigate that so if if they're doing that um you know maybe just be like okay well we're definitely not plugging into computers and everything when we get home we're gonna yeah. you know drop the light lower the lights you know if you're stuck with led bulbs and all that like you do candle light and things like that and mm -hmm. and sort of have a wind down time before bed you know and, and maybe go to bed a little earlier uh so i think you know all this stuff sort of exists on a continuum. And so, you know, I, I, I the, the, the big message is, yeah, we're bombarded with all these artificial uh, EMFs, but, you know, don't despair. It's not, it's not that bad. We can handle it. Um, yeah. And, and the way you handle it is sort of, you just, you, you do what you can, you, you mitigate where you can. And, uh, you know, and most of us are fine, uh, you know, do seem to handle it just fine. So I think you just sort of, you kind of weigh the pros and the cons, right? So if they're doing Taekwondo, they're getting a lot of exercise. So there's a lot of, okay, they're under bright LED lights, but they're getting a lot of exercise and they're getting some camaraderie and all that. So the, the, the net effect is positive. And then you can work around it too, to sort of mitigate the effect. So yeah, they're getting this hit, but maybe, maybe they put on some yellow glasses while they're there. Um, you know, if you let them convince them to do that and then, you know, I or not. Yet. I'll work on it. <laughs> Um, I get a big fat eye roll on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we do too. We're trying to get them to play their computer games with orange lenses, but uh, so, but even then, even if you don't, right? So it, again, it's like okay, well, they're getting that hit, but if they're doing a good job and getting a good natural light exposure right at the start of the day, mm -hmm. that that uh, goes a long way towards sort of setting the clock for the day um, and making sure that they don't get too much, you know. So you you know, if you give them a couple of hours before bedtime where they're not getting another blue light hit like that's probably going to be good enough um right. to sort of mitigate and then you know kind of back to concussion and so if we want to you know talk about yeah. prevention right is yeah. same same sort of idea uh, you probably you know getting you know getting the sleep hygiene all tuned up is is super important for prevention um you know just kind of i mean that's probably the biggest thing healthy kind of balanced diet. Um, I won't get too much into that, but uh, because that's a little different for everybody too, but, you know, doing, doing those things, doing, getting your light it, um, exposures tuned up ahead of time. So, and, and maybe being really diligent about reducing the artificial blue light. I mean, you really could just folk say it's all about the sleep hygiene and, and prevention and, and you'll kind of get all the hit all the right notes as far as the light. If you're kind of doing it for your sleep, you'll you'll be optimizing your brain. You'll be optimizing your CSF if it is in fact structured water, which I bet it is. I suspect it is. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so you'll be able to kind of mitigate that. And then also too, you'll be set up you'll for quick healing if you do end up with a concussion. So um, you know, if you're it's it's same idea that with musculoskeletal injuries. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when someone's going in for a semi-elective 
the surgery or something like they'll go to physical therapy before the surgery, you know, and, right. and sort of really kind of get the, the muscles and everything as strong as possible beforehand. And then that translates to quicker recovery after the surgery. Same, same thing would go for concussion. You know, if you're really taking good, good care of yourself going into it, hopefully it doesn't happen, but if it does, you'll right. be setting yourself up to have a good, quick recovery uh, afterwards. Okay. So yet another, and that yet another reason to <laughs> just take into account um, our light environment in terms of how we live, mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to optimize performance and also optimize recovery should an injury occur, mm -hmm. um, and just keep everybody safer and healthier, which is what we all want. <laughs> we're exactly. Trying to, exactly. We're trying to get there. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's great. So yeah, I've, I've reached a point with my children where they, they will wear their blue blockers when we're at home, mm -hmm. but they, but a public is a bridge too far. So yeah. I'm like, all right, now we got to get some, I can live with it. We got to get some influencers, influencers out there. I know. <laughs> I was talking with Terry Bennett about that recently. I think, I think the, I think there's some athletes who are, who are about to drink the quantum biology kool-aid and start <laughs> start showing up and <laughs> start showing up in public in blue walkers i think mm -hmm. we're, we're getting there hopefully um so all right wonderful so th what always happens is when i do one of these amazing interviews is people are like oh my god i wish i had a doctor like that yeah. <laughs> so how can people find you and i know that you are sort of navigating the traditional healthcare world versus setting up something mm -hmm. individualized concierge, like tell us where you're at with that. And sure. Yeah. Well, that could be a whole other podcast talking about the, <laughs> the plight of a physician and, uh, in navigating, uh, you know, the modern medical system and then also maybe making the switch. Um, so, and that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm still in sort of the, the process of, of reinventing myself in terms of practice, but I, I do have, I, I'm not, I don't have, I've limited uh, openings in, in my own practice now, but I think uh, that will change because of, because of insurance things like, so right. um, I'll back up a little. So I'm, I'm my, pra my personal practice model is, you know, what we'd call direct primary care or direct care. And the, okay. the concept is there's, we don't accept insurance. So it's usually a membership model. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, you know, I am, contracting directly with you, the patient, to provide, to offer medical expertise. Actually, I think I'd prefer that to, than to say provide care or whatever. And okay. that's really the idea is that now we have a direct one-to-one -one relationship where you you have questions and hopefully I have answers or and vice versa. And, and we kind of work together as a team in terms of coming up with what you, you know, what you want to do as opposed to kind of the established system, which is very much kind of algorithm driven now. And uh, okay. Well, it's like, okay, well, you've got high blood pressure. I got to put you on a drug. Otherwise I don't get paid for the visit. You got high cholesterol. I got to put you on a drug otherwise, or, you know, and, wow. and so it, 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 there's this third so party. That's why like a healthy 53 year old woman who is physically active and has no problems with anything. She goes to her doctor and there's a slightly elevated blood pressure and she's now on a statin. Um, well, she'd be on a, you know, a beta blocker, but. Or sorry, right, elevated that, cholesterol is what I meant yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And so, um, you know, theoretically the patient still sort of has a say in whether they take this medicine or not, but uh, you know, it, it's the, you know, suddenly there's the, it's the insurers that are doing this because it's data driven and, you know, limitations of data are such that, well, you know, they, they give you an answer, but it's not necessarily the right one. Right. So, but there's data that says, okay, well, people with high cholesterol that take a statin have lower cholesterol. <laughs> so Everybody yeah. should, everybody with high cholesterol should be on a statin. I know people who worked in the <laughs> statin research industry who, let's just say, no longer work in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were so, like, yeah, I'll, I'll know. try not to get us canceled here. So I'll, I'll probably okay. stop there. But so, but <laughs> yeah. the, the illustration of the point is, okay, well, there, you know, there's the third party that is good, well-intentioned in terms of trying to you right. know, manage costs or whatever. Okay. But so the, the, it's, the, it's suboptimal for the patient, maybe. Right. Okay. And so the, 
the well-intentioned perspective is that we do all this research and we figure out what is statistically the best thing to do in this situation. And then the doctors are basically required to do it. That's the essentially. Yeah. And then the page. So then, okay. And then the patient's taking a drug. That's the generous way to explain it. (laughs) So anyway, yeah, we're getting off track. Right. right? So it's, but so that's the idea behind the direct care model. Um, And just in general, even, even before, you know, this, you know, kind of quality based care kind of came into fashion. Insurance is just very challenging to deal with in terms of trying to be reimbursed. And certainly they don't pay for time spent. Um, You know, so my, the way I like to work with people is we're going to sit down for an hour or or whatever Mm -hmm. and insurance will not pay for that. So, uh, so the direct care model, I think is really where it's at for that. And so that's what I'm, I'm developing. And, um, but so the other thing is, so, you know, it's not enough to just say, I'm, I'm not going to bill insurance. If someone has insurance, uh, basically they kind of have first rights <laughs> to the patient. So even though I'm not billing insurance, you know, if it's something that is theoretically billable, I'm not allowed to see that person. So it's, it becomes, it's a bit of a process where, okay, well, you've got to sort of opt out and separate yourself from all the insurance plans and I'm starting to work on that. So it's going to take a little while, but I'm I'm in process. I I can see some people, but not all. And um, so, you know, I can be, if, you know, if people want to connect with me, they can just uh, find me at gregorystenkinmd.com. Uh, and there's some contact information there. The other, I'll, I'll actually, I'm going to give my wife a plug too, though. So she's, so she's in the class now. Yeah. uh, Amanda's amazing. Tell us about Amanda. So her background, she's a neuroscience PhD Mm -hmm. and uh, she's gotten into um, a couple of different things. So she actually sort of led me into this journey in quantum biology. Uh, So I have her to thank for that. And um, thanks Amanda. (laughs) So she's, uh, been learning a couple of different techniques. Uh, so she's all neuro. And uh, so she's doing some primitive reflex training. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's started her own. She's really wanted to get into clinical, you know, care. So she's started her own kind of health coaching uh, practice, Orios Wellness. And so I think she'd be a great resource as well. Um, and I'm I'm kind of her operations and medical advisor too. So there's a, Perfect. there's a little medical feedback in there. And, um, but yeah, so, and she's working on her naturopathic degree at the same time now. So, right. uh, so I think she'd be a great resource. And I think just in general, so, you know, in terms of back to kind of what I do or what I want to do in essence, I feel like I'm becoming a health coach. So I think that's a great thing to think about for people to think about is find a good, I mean, maybe even still have a conventional you know, allopathic uh, or, you know, MD or DO physician, but really think about finding a sort of quant, you know, a a health coach that's in the quantum biology realm um, as, as a adjunct and uh, to, to help get a different perspective on things. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's something that people should really consider. Thank you. Yes. I love that. Um, yeah, Ab- Amanda absolutely will put the links to find her in sure. um, in the show notes and the links to find you. And yeah, I appreciate you saying that because I that's sort of my message to everybody is like, just have at least one person in your life, like one practitioner, and it's probably a health coach because they're structured to have the time to do it, right? Who really exactly. knows your deal yeah. <laughs> and knows yeah. your specific <clears throat> situation. And then if you need to be, re- you know, if you need some other kind of specialist, like, they can help you be like, hmm, you might want to get a therapist. You might want to see a chiropractor. You might want to exactly. talk to a surgeon. I don't know. But just having yep. someone who's, as you're saying, like where their business is structured around knowing their clients or their patients and mm-hmm. knowing their all of their details is something that we've really lost. And when you're explaining like the type of practice you, you're looking to set up, I'm like, oh, it's like, it's like the old fashioned doctor, right? It's like yeah. where there would be a doctor within the community who would know the people, would know the families. I was reading a memoir recently of someone who grew up whose parents were doctors like in the 1940s and mm-hmm. they would go to people's houses and 
go and, you know, go and help the sick person and then come down and like have tea or coffee with the rest of the family. And like, they knew Mm -hmm. the family dynamics. They knew like the person's living environment. Like they had all of this information because it was, it was like a a relationship based way of doing things, which is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and you see the whole family dynamic, usually it ends up being that, okay, in a direct care model, it's, it's really geared towards kind of bringing in the whole family. Um, and so, and there's right. definitely a lot that can be gleaned from that, um, from being able to see those relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, bless you for, for, you know, working to figure this all out from a scientific perspective, from medical perspective, from a mm-hmm. business structure perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you're really doing a great service, even just, you know, beyond what you're doing for your own business to Mm -hmm. become a role model because there are I think so many doctors who would if they're if they could see a clear path to a different way of doing things they would take it I would for sure yeah I I definitely think you know direct care I think uh, opening your mind to different ideas like quantum biology uh I mean these are just great solutions I to to burn out to burn out prevention um for physicians um you know I, I don't know that I was, was burned out, but I definitely, uh, in, in the last couple of years, but I definitely feel like, you know, learning, learning, you know, absorbing new information just sort of revitalizes the practice of medicine. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, it's been really, it's been really great just being part of the quantum biology collective and, uh, you know, and, and learning from everybody and, and kind of sharing and it's been a great experience. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, you've brought so much to the community and where, you know, we've loved having you. And this is, it's, it's fun. Uh, so if anyone's listening, they want to like get involved or do something like reach out. This is, it's really fun mm-hmm. and it's really impactful. And thank you so much, Gregory. Thank you for being here and thank you for doing all the things you do. My pleasure. I, was, I had a great time. Okay. We'll do it again. Sounds good. If you're interested in working with Dr. Stankin, check out the show notes for his website and email address. He is happy to hear from you. And do visit www.qbcpod.com, qbcpod.com, to get access to searchable transcripts of our popular episodes, a free ideal circadian day download, and our QBC product guide. We would love to have you in there and look forward to hearing from you. See you next time. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.